Okay, well, good morning. So first of all, let me thank the organizers for this very great opportunity to be in front of you. It's really a privilege to be in front of such an audience. And uh, so I have to say that I'm coming from the scientist, scientific part. So as you, you will notice that while I'm speaking, I don't have slides. So what I want to do in these uh, 25 minutes is to uh, give you a, an, a view of the field of quantum computation. That's the, that's the field where I'm working from the point of view of science. And uh, you'll see that uh, probably it's different from the point of view that other people have here. So actually we are uh, experiencing, for people like me, we're experiencing at the moment a great time. So we started working on quantum computing about 30 years ago. And at that time, this was no way mainstream in science, in physics, or even in quantum physics. That was a complete, complete weird area of research that nobody almost dare to say that they was working on that because it was so, such a weird. And I mean, things evolve a lot. And now we are living this uh, uh, a situation in which, I mean, people like you coming from, not only from science, but also from industry, from let's see, politics, from many places have raised the interest on quantum computation. And that's really great. And from the scientific point of view, that's a fantastic time. And this allows us also to make much more scientific progress than we could do alone. So that's helping our field very much. But, but at the same time, this opens up some concerns for the scientific point of view, and I want to talk about them as well. So you all are aware of the fact that quantum computing has raised uh, a big hype and uh, in the media and in many places. On the other hand, there is a lot of hopes of many people thinking that quantum computers can solve some problems or will solve some problems that otherwise I mean, mankind will not be able to solve. And then we have the evidence of what can a quantum computer be built. And we have the current quantum computers which are, which are built. And these are three axes that have some overlaps, some intersections, but actually are quite different. And so I want to give my talk uh, within these three axes, just mentioning some of the applications that have been discussed in the context of quantum computation and each of them try to see from my point of view and maybe from the point of view of some other scientists where they are, what are the expectations, and so what's true, what is not, what is to be expected or hoped. Uh, so quantum computation, you know it very well. And well, I have to, maybe before I start, I was not here yesterday, so I'm sure that many of the things that I will say here were already explained yesterday. So I'm, I'm sorry for the overlap that I will have with some previous speakers here, but nevertheless, so I'll, I'll, I'll want to bring up some, some of the points. Well, so the first thing is the, the question, so what, why do we want a quantum computer? So what can a quantum computer do? That's, I mean, I think that's a driving a question of quantum computation. If it just was some, I mean, curious device that can test some properties of physics or something like that, it would not have raised the interest. And so now you go to the media, you will see that there are many, many applications. They go from saving us from climate change to saving us from cancer, from many other things. However, that's, that's the hype, okay? The hope is that it will be able to solve some problems that I will mention later on, but the evidence is actually relatively small. So first of all, we know that if we had a quantum computer, then Cryptography would be in danger, and you had some talks about that yesterday, and we have evidence of that. So we know that if we had a quantum computer, then the cryptographic systems that we are using nowadays will stop to be secure, and we will have to change them by either quantum computer or post-quantum -quant communication, quantum cryptography, or post-quantum computing. That's one. The other big evidence is that if we had a quantum computer, we could solve problems in science that we will never be able to solve otherwise, problems that appear typically in physics or in chemistry. And some of the problems that appear in physics and chemistry may even have some industrial applications, for example, in material science, in drug design, chemistry reactions, and so on. So that's another part that we are very sure that quantum computers will help us or can help us. And these are basically the two main ones. That's where quantum computers have, like we call it an exponential speed up, a huge speed up, and therefore, that's where quantum computers will be able to solve problems that otherwise we will not be able to solve with, with our standard computers, supercomputers, even in 20 or 100 years. 
There are some other problems for which quantum computers have what we call polynomial speed up. That's where, I mean, there's a speed up that can be helpful, but it's not so spectacular. These are problems related, for example, with optimization. And these are problems in which industry is very interested because there are many processes that appear in industry that can be boiled down to some optimization problems. And this can make big savings and make a lot of efficiency in, in companies, corporates. And for those, we know that with the algorithms that have been developed, the standard algorithms for which you can show that they are going to work and that they have advantage, then they have this polynomial advantage. And therefore, this may be useful in the future if we build these quantum computers. There is another field which is in machine learning in which uh, we know that there might be exponential speed up. However, this exponential speed up for the moment is only known for academic problems. For problems that are not academic, for real time problems, then we speculate that there might be some advantage, some polynomial advantage. Okay, so that's a case that's a little bit in between. There is this huge advantage, but for the moment, it's only for some really academic problems that don't have use cases. I mean, there was a time that's a, something that happened five years ago in which some people came up with an idea of how to use quantum computers to solve a real use case problem that was based on this uh, uh, Netflix uh, recommendation system. And indeed, there, and what is an exponential speed up what was found. However, I mean, months after that, some other classical algorithm was developed, inspired by this quantum algorithm, which is able also to solve this, this problem more efficiently. This also teaches us that this quantum computation that we are developing, we are not alone. And it's inspiring a lot of algorithms or methods that in more standard, uh, let's say, uh, ways that can be also useful. And in fact, I mean, I know that there are some companies and startups that are working precisely on that. But anyway, we have these four basically applications. Of course, there might be some small here and there, but these are the four categories in which two of them are very clear and two of them are kind of well, very, very hopes and, and expectations. Now, uh, you look at the, at the situation that we have at the moment is that we don't have the quantum computers. I mean, they are not here and it will take a long time to be here. And the reason is that because they have errors, we have prototypes and they have errors and these errors have to be corrected. And as you know very well, I mean, this requires a lot of engineering. And just making a back of the envelope calculation, you will see that, I mean, it cannot take two years, three years, four years. We're talking more about 10 years or something like that. So we are a little bit, and you, will, you have probably heard that before many times, reviving what happened in the 40s when the first classical computers were invented. That at that time, they had like very big devices that were not very powerful. And so one may wonder, so if at the moment we only know these very big two, uh, two applications, which are one scientific, the other one is cryptography, the other ones are so not so clear. So why do we have now to pay so much attention to quantum computation? Well, let's back to the 40s of the last century. And the first computers that were built had basically two applications. One was to decode cryptographic systems. I mean, that was the time of the, of the Second World War. And the second application that was clear at that time was for scientific research. There were statements of many famous people saying that nobody can imagine that these computers that they were building would be useful for anything else than that, that probably only five people in the world will have, I mean, will use this as personal computers. That was said by, by Watson or the IBM heads at the time. And so I think that, I mean, what we scientists expecting and society is also expecting is that the same thing happen, will happen with quantum computers, that even though we know these two big applications, there will be many more to come in the way that we, when we develop these quantum computers. And that's, I think, we, we also think from the scientific point of view, the scientists, we have little evidence, we try to gain more evidence, but we also hope that the quantum computers are at our disposal, that we can try and look for things that at the moment we cannot uh, foresee. Now, the second, the, but, but there is a difference from the, from the computers that were built in the 40s. 
The main difference from the computers that we have now, the prototypes of quantum computers that we have now, from the ones that we have in the 40s, is that the ones that we have now still they require big labs, many of them, very extreme conditions, but they are faulty. The ones that they were building in the 40s, they were not faulty. They were not very powerful, but they, if you multiply seven times three, it was uh, so the 21. Now you take a quantum computer and you do the same multiplication, you will not get 21. They have errors. And so this means that uh, if we want now to see what are these applications that I mentioned at the beginning, these four applications that they, or any other application, then we'll have to take into account these errors and whether in the presence of errors, these applications are still useful for something. And that's what in many scientists, among myself, but many other scientists and other companies and other people in the world are trying now to find out. So whether problems in, say, scientific problem or cryptographic problems or optimization problems or machine learning problems still can get an advantage in the presence of the errors with, with the quantum computers. Now, at the beginning, it was thought that yes, and there was a piece of evidence that this may be like that. This piece of evidence was given by Google in the year 2019, where they proved in an experiment that for one particular problem, their quantum computers with errors that they were building, these prototypes with errors, was able to solve it, and whereas classical supercomputers would take years and years, many millions of years. And in fact, you can interpret the problem that they were posing as a problem related to machine learning. So it was a problem in which the problem was formulated in a way that is very suitable for quantum computers and very bad for classical computers was to sample random numbers according to certain distribution. And with the quantum computers, they did it very efficiently, and with classical computers, this is something that is very difficult. And as you know, I mean, in, in many problems in machine learning, so what you have to do is at the end to learn some probability distribution and then to sample according to this probability distribution, for example, in generative models. And so the hope at that time is that since they showed that for something which is uh, somehow related to machine learning, then these quantum computers, even with the presence of errors, would be very useful for machine learning problems. However, I mean, one has to say that the problem that Google was uh, posing actually is completely trivial in the sense of sampling if you don't want to get all the details of the data that you're sampling. In fact, it's a completely flat distribution what they are sampling, and the difference is only at an exponentially small level. And therefore, the problem that they were dealing with there, what they showed is what is so-called quantum supremacy, is a problem that is not useless because you could sample it randomly with a classical computer, and only if you would try to get the latest detail, this exponentially small difference in the probabilities, then is where the quantum computer would have the advantage. So this also posed some questions about the advantages of these faulty error quantum computers in machine learning. But still, let me, let me go one, one by one to these applications that I mentioned in the context of uh, errors and to see, so what do we know, what do we expect, what is high, what is hope, what is evidence? So let me start maybe with cryptography. So in cryptography, I think that it's very, very clear that these faulty quantum computers will very, very likely not be helpful in cryptography, that in order to factorize the big numbers that we require in order to break the codes, we need fault-tolerant quantum computations, and if you have errors, then probably you cannot exploit that for uh, breaking codes. There are some algorithms that have been proposed, some heuristic algorithms, but I think that there is very little evidence that these algorithms will perform better, better than any classical algorithm. So I would say that cryptography, with these prototypes that we're building, not with the quantum computers that will be built in the future, but with the ones that are built now, probably has not many chances. On the other side, we have the scientific uh, applications. And scientific applications so typically goes under the name of quantum simulation. And the idea is that if you have some material or you have some chemical uh, product, some chemical compound, then for, if you want to make predictions about how it will behave, what are the physical or chemical properties, it's extremely hard with standard computers. And that's where quantum computers have an advantage. 
And the advantage is so big there. It's the, the problem is so well suited for quantum computers and so badly suited for classical computers that there, I think that there is a very big evidence that even these first generations of prototypes can give us advantage, especially for problems related to physics, maybe to material science. And everything. So I think that there we can really claim that as long as the errors are not very big, but even if there is some constant error rate in your quantum computer, there are some problems which have scientific interest that you will be able to solve with these quantum devices that are being built. Now, if we go to the optimization problems, there I'm much more skeptical. And the reason is that to start with, even with a, a perfect quantum computer, there is not such a big advantage. So you put errors on top of that, then probably it will be very hard to, um, to uh, to, to, I mean, to, to use this device for solving these problems. Uh, of course, I mean, that's, that's evidence based on facts that people have studied this, uh, some of the algorithms that have been proposed in the presence of errors, and they have seen that whenever these algorithms may become competitive with classical algorithms, then there are so many errors that there is no information whatsoever in your quantum computer. It's like if you would have bits in your computer and then you're flipping them randomly, and in the end you will have a random number, so you will not solve any problem with a random number. And so there is an evidence of that. However, of course, that's, that's evidence for some particular algorithms and for some error models. But I think that they are quite broad, and now that's my personal opinion, that it will be very hard to get any advantage in these optimization problems with faulty devices, unless you can also get it from the models that we use, the errors that are in the, uh, these prototypes that are being built go orders of magnitude below the ones that we have now. So the ones that we have now are basically an error rate, is an error when you perform a quantum gate, there's an error, and the probability for that is the uh, error rate, what we call error rate, and it's of the order of 10 to the minus three, and it has to go to the order to 10 to the minus six who you want to exploit for optimization problem. And so the last is the, the machine learning. And for the machine learning, there is, uh, there is I think, where there is a little more hope. And that's the, the, the reason is because I somehow I mentioned that there are these problems, which are like the scientific problems, which are very well suited for quantum computers. These are quantum problems themselves, so you just better solve it with quantum computers. There are these other problems, which are optimization problems, which are very classical problems. So they are not formulated with the language of classical computer. You translate it into the language, but that's why they are not so useful. And then there are these machine learning problems, which are a little bit in between, because at the end, in these machine learning problems, you have a lot of data and you have to uh, I mean, represent some, some functions. And maybe even if you don't, uh, are not exact with the representation of the functions that you want to represent, this probability distribution that you mentioned before, then it may still be useful for, for something. And so that's why, uh, I mean, I think that there is a little bit more hope. However, the evidence that we had was first what I mentioned at the beginning for for less faultless quantum computers, this exponential speed up is not uh, is only for academic problems. And so whenever we don't have this exponential speed up and we only have what is called polynomial speed up for the ideal case in the presence of errors, then it's hard to believe that there will be some advantage, but still this may happen. So um, of course, I mean, for me, it would be fantastic having worked in this field for many years to come here and to say, well, now we can solve that and now we can heal it. The, the, uh, we hold to the hospital with our quantum computers, and, uh, but that's not that's not the evidence what what we have, and that's I mean since I mean I'm not investing money in any in any company, I'm not part of any company, and I can see it very freely, and that's what I wanted to to tell you. Still, I want to uh, emphasize what I was saying at the beginning. Two things that I was saying in the beginning. So first thing is that despite. We believe that this is true and probably this big hype that is being constructed around quantum computation at some point will exploit. And then people will see that many of the problems for which we are making all these promises don't work in practice. And then somebody else is selling a classical device for which it's better than this quantum device. Uh, and this is explosion and then will have come the quantum winter as people have coined it. And the field of quantum computation is interesting nevertheless 
So we will have to live with that in the future, say 10, 20, 30 years, we will need quantum computers and we will have quantum computers. So that's why it's very important that even when this quantum winter comes, that all of a sudden this uh, field of quantum computation is not proscribed or taken away and uh, so that we continue doing our research. People try to still improve the quantum computers because at some point they will come and as I mentioned before, we go back to the 40s, even though the applications that we have in mind are not, let's say, killing applications for the moment, probably, I mean, as they are here, then they will change of your future. So that's one, one, one part that I think that is important to remark, that uh, we have to be prepared for the quantum winter, and it's good that we say it now, that we don't say it when the quantum winter comes, that we say it in, beforehand, right? And that's what I'm, why I'm saying it here. The second part is that uh, this field of quantum computation, of course, now has uh, many people trying in companies, startups. We are trying to, to, to uh, find applications, and it may well be that there are applications that we don't know, even with these noiseless quantum computers, because now what I have said is what we have evidence for. But since there are many people all over the world trying different things, it may well happen that there are things that we cannot even think that we'll have where we find applications. So it's great that this is happening. But it's also, uh, the field of quantum computation is still, I think, or has a very big part of scientific, scientific research. So we want to understand quantum computations with errors, and you can formulate it as a scientific question, I mean, following the scientific method. Uh, we want to understand what are other applications, despite, I mean, beyond the ones that I mentioned before. We, can, and this, we want to understand other other ways of using quantum computers not to speed up computations. And just let me give you one example that I find that it's very exemplary. And uh, so four or five years ago, when people were thinking about the question, so if I have a quantum computer at some point, how, I mean, do I convince you that I have a quantum computer? So I have it here and then I offer it on the cloud. And so how do you know that I don't have a classical computer, that for problems that you can solve classically, it gives you the right result, and for problems that you cannot solve classically, it gives you another result, but since you can, don't have a quantum computer, you cannot check, so I'm cheating you. And so there, there are people asking this question more from the uh, computer scientists, more from the fundamental point of view, and they came up with some ideas of checking that I indeed have a quantum computer. It's, inter it's for the computer scientists who are in the room, it's, re it's related to uh, interacting proofs. And so that you being, having only classical computer and classical communication can make sure that I have a quantum computer even though you're not able to do the computation to check yourself. And by doing that, then they realize that if they have a method for, for that, then actually this can be used as a certified random number generator. Because if I, you can make sure that I have a quantum computer, I can create superposition, you can make sure that I have something what is called superposition, and if I measure the result is completely random. It's completely random, so you can make sure that the number that I'm giving you is completely random. So in other words, you play lottery, you have to trust that the people who are taking out the numbers, somehow they are not cheating. And there is no way of certifying that in our classical world. There is no way that you can make sure that the numbers that somebody is taking out did not pre-exist it and they're cheating you and somebody bought the, the, the lottery before and then they get the number and they're they doing that. There is no uh, classical way of doing that. However, with a quantum computer, you can make sure, completely sure, that the number that is given to you never existed before and nobody had it. This is what is called certified quantum number generation. So what I mean is that, yes, by looking at this problem, by doing research and by trying, then there was all of a sudden some application that was unexpected and that nobody could think of. And this may have, I mean, there are people thinking about how to use that, but that's what one of the examples. And with that example, what I mean is that in this, the entrepreneur that we are taking together, let's say scientists and now uh, uh, companies, startups, corporations, and so on, then there might be things that are coming out that are completely unexpected. So I looked and I know it and I'm aware that during my presentation here, 
I uh, sounded uh, pessimistic, but I want to end up with this more optimistic point of view, saying that there is a lot of things to be done, and that's extremely interesting, and that I'm very happy that we are in this world, having now all these prototypes at our disposal, that if it was not because of this, let's say, hype that I was talking about, they will not be here, and we will not have the opportunity of doing this research. And with that, I think that I'm finished. Thank you for your time.